What if we were the one who provided durable, sanitized containers back to the restaurants and health the problems? Yes, let's design it like that because that helps reduce barriers. You can show up to a restaurant. You don't have to remember to bring anything. There they are right there for you. And on the restaurant side, they're buying fewer disposable containers. And we are encouraging customers to go to those restaurants. You're listening to Honey and Hustle, a video podcast that inspires the dreamers, creators, and hustlers to make a business from their passions. I'm Angela Hollowell, and I'm a visual storyteller based in Durham, North Carolina. I sit down with creative entrepreneurs, nonprofit founders, and small business owners as they share their stories, the lessons they've learned throughout their careers, and how they've worked to make a positive impact. I am here with Crystal Dreisbach of Don't Waste Durham. Uh, and the creator and innovator behind uh, green to go which is an incredible uh, service uh, that is part of their nonprofit that is revenue generating as well for them. And that we'll dive into here shortly. Crystal, thank you so much for being here with me. Oh, I'm so glad to be here, Angela. Thank you. Uh, So it's a little rainy Monday in Durham. So we're going to ease into things nice and slow to match the vibe of this slow Monday, make it a little more bearable for us all. Um, so I first came across uh, Green To Go before I knew about Don't Waste Durham, which is the parent organization. And Green To Go is essentially a reusable um, kind of plating system. And they've partnered with local restaurants to help reduce the waste from packaging of to-go materials. And that was especially helpful during the pandemic. Obviously, Green To Go started before the pandemic, but elevated in importance and relevancy Um, especially during a time when people were forced to get a lot of their meals to go uh, for better or for worse, because now we have um, entered into a space where people are more conscious about the amount of waste that is associated with to-go plating meals, right? Um, And so for service businesses like restaurants um, that really can make a huge difference in decreasing the amount of waste that they produce by engaging with reusable materials, I think that you're able to meet two needs. One, meet the needs of decreasing the waste in our local community, but also giving revenue back to a business so they don't have to spend as much on to-go materials. So can you talk a little bit about how your nonprofit kind of bridges the gap between environmental sustainability and small businesses? Absolutely. You really explained that super well, Angela. Um, You know, Don't Waste Durham was created when we realized there was a real gap, a real unfilled need to do prevention of waste. You know, a lot of people do recycling, a lot of people do litter cleanup, and we think those are great, but that's people dealing with waste that already exists. And we wanted to make waste not exist in the first place. And when we brainstormed, you know, what are the barriers to a, what we call a circular reuse economy, where we're buying things high quality, durable one time, and then getting them into circulation. And that's a whole different economic model than you know buying disposables over and over and over to be used once and then heading to the landfill. So we thought to ourselves, what are the barriers to a circular reuse economy? Why aren't we already doing it? Well, there's a ton of barriers, right? Who's gonna buy those durable containers? How are they gonna be made available in restaurants. And we also had some health department sort of challenges and we actually partnered with the health department so they could help us design how this would work. Turns out, you know, a lot of, you can, if you want to, bring your own container to a restaurant and put your own leftovers in it if you want. But really, who really does that? Because how would you remember to bring your own container? Do you really want to put that in your purse? You know, and it doesn't really cut down a ton of waste in our community. But we thought, what if we washed them centrally? What if we were the one who provided durable, sanitized containers back to the restaurants and health departments? Yes, let's design it like that because that helps reduce barriers. You can show up to a restaurant. You don't have to remember to bring anything. 
there they are right there for you. And they're on the restaurant side, they're buying fewer disposable containers. And we are encouraging customers to go to those restaurants. Restaurants want a few things. They want people to come to their restaurant and eat and pay money so that they can pay their staff and survive. They also want to stand out. Uh, they want something that sets them apart from other restaurants. So we helped provide that. And of course, we too are very proud of our restaurants. So we're also co-promoting the restaurants. So we think of ourselves almost like a loyalty program with a box. Um, it's, a, it's a club and there's stickers on the doors of these restaurants. And there's um, you know, a little bit of marketing display in the restaurant. This helps the restaurant stand out from other restaurants. So we were learning these things. What, what are the, you know, in business terms, what's the value proposition for a restaurant to join this program? And what's the value proposition for a customer to want to join this program? So we've done so much learning in the six years that we've operated um, this program. And we found out a ton of things and I, I'd be happy to share. Um, but what was great was what evolved out of Green To Go. We'll keep Green To Go because it's really special to us. It, it doesn't just reduce waste, but also opens people's mind a little bit. They see it happening even if they don't use Green To Go. They can see it and they say, oh, there's another way. And what you want to do is just shift that neurology just a little bit in people's minds to know that another way is possible. And so what really grew out of that is people are saying now, wow, what else can we reuse? And that has expanded us to having reusable pizza boxes. And that's something that people can understand and grasp even quicker than a reusable takeout container. Everybody loves pizza. And everybody knows those big cardboard boxes are confusing. They're like very large and unwieldy and it's wasteful. You eat your pizza in 30 minutes and then you have to throw away this big box. So we said, you know what, let's give that a try because there's a pizza restaurant that's like, you want to try it. It's Pie Pushers in downtown Durham. And it was wildly successful. So we've now been doing it over two years with pizza boxes and lots of pizza restaurants want this too. So we're exploring that. And then people are like, what else can we reuse? What about um, coffee cups, you know, is another big one. And what has even grown bigger outside of Green To Go is further this circular reuse economy that has to do with the economics of things. So, it's not just restaurants now. We also have a packaging free grocery store that's right on Chapel Hill Street in Durham. And we make it possible for them to be packaging free because we take used jars, we wash and sanitize them, and then we supply them with jars. So you, for example, Angela could just walk right into the store, take a sanitized jar off their shelf, fill it with whatever you'd like from their store, and you don't have to remember to bring anything. And what's great is this is a store that doesn't have to pay for packaging. They don't have to buy it. All of these jars are provided by their customers. They bring them back or all of us encounter jars in our everyday lives. We can donate those jars. And what we see is that people are like, oh, look at this pasta jar. It's so beautiful. Why would we just use it once and throw it away? It could be reused. But, you know, how many pen cups can you make out of pasta sauce jars? What we want is recirculation, not just reuse. And so that's really expanding people's minds. Same with a home goods and, and soap store that's in Durham. They do refillable soaps and refillable cleaning products. And we wash um, their jugs and bags for them so that they can go and refill their customers out in the community like hotels and restaurants and that helps them save money on packaging so it really becomes an economic thing and i think more and more people are starting to understand that if a service exists and it's so simple it's pickup wash and delivery 
we solve the problem of people having to go reuse. We just started Going to Go Party Pack, and we've been experimenting with that. That is basically um, large sanitized totes that contain everything you need in it for everything from a backyard barbecue to a giant pop-up dinner. Um, you know, beautiful ceramic plates, stainless steel cutlery, fabric napkins, reusable cups. They just tell us how many they need. We bring it. They use it, put it all back in the box, dirty. We take it back, wash, sanitize, ready to use again. So Green to Go was sort of like the first way six years ago we started changing the economic landscape of how we do consumerism and disposables here in Durham. Thank you for breaking that down and uh, expanding it past the to-go plate. I think that was really interesting. I personally don't eat pizza. You probably have met one of the five people in the world that don't eat pizza. So that's probably why I didn't know about the reusable pizza box. <laughs> but um, it's very interesting. You're talking about, you know, this, you know, circular economy and how this really can positively impact the, you know, bottom line for a small business. That's really important. How it can positively impact, you know, our waste and decreasing that in the, in the community. And one thing that, you know, people love to say is, you know, when you, you find a way to disrupt a market or when you find a way to add value to someone and you're passionate about it, that's what you should start a business on, right? And you did start a business, but a nonprofit, not a for-profit. So can you talk to me about why you decided to go that route and have even still green to go under that nonprofit um, umbrella and not have it be a for-profit entity that feeds into the nonprofit. I'm so glad you asked this. I think that nonprofits have a really important role to play in solving a lot of the world's problems. And you can argue absolutely, so do for-profit companies. But here's a couple of reasons why I just love, um, you know, running startups under our nonprofit umbrella. And one way is that it is very low risk. So nonprofits are supported financially in a different way than for-profits, right? A lot of times they're getting grants or foundation funding or charitable donations. And we have some different funding mechanisms that are afforded to us than for-profits. For-profits obviously have a lot of funding mechanisms that aren't available to nonprofit. But I believe that the advantage to the way our funding works is that we can take more risks up front. So if we say, you know what, we have no clue if this reusable takeout thing is going to work, like how we felt back in 2016, we could be like, okay, people, do you like this idea? Let's put our money together um, and see if it works. And then we're able to use volunteers to try out an idea. You know, we're able to more easily partner with existing infrastructure in Durham because we're a nonprofit. So, for example, we needed a wash facility. That wasn't something we could afford up front to just like buy our own building and hire staff. So for the first three years of ideating and agile design of how this worked, because we were creating something completely new that didn't exist before, we had to do a lot of experimenting. So we looked everywhere. Where can we find an existing wash facility that will let us use their commercial dishwasher and get permitted by the health department to do this crazy idea? And we looked high and low. And finally, we approached TROSA, which is, as we know, a very beloved nonprofit in Durham. And they immediately said, oh, of course, we would definitely love to, you know, two nonprofits working together to support each other and share resources is that's what we're all about. And we ended up um, employing TROSA graduates in our business. And they, the people in the kitchen where we did our dishwashing loved our idea and they would just help us. And so we ran for the first three years completely on volunteers. And that's not necessarily something you can always do with for-profits. We are also afforded lots of free things as a nonprofit. So we had, you know, legal needs, right? 
we can get all the free legal services we need from Duke University or North Carolina Central University has a patent law clinic that's free for um, nonprofits. So we have access to a lot of things that we might not otherwise have as a for-profit. Um, we have so many interns. Uh, we have people who say, gosh, I love what you're doing. Here's $500. And we're like, thank you so very much. Um, so uh, the so financially, there's there are some things that I think are really beneficial. You can take um, big, big um, leaps at very low risk. You're not beholden to investors or anything like that. You're not under the pressure of in return on investment. Um, I mean, you still have to operate well. Clearly, we do operate like a business. We have incomes and ex income and expenses. Um, we need those to match up as best as possible. Um, we need to compete if there is are there are competitors, uh, things like that. The second reason is because I think. Um, nonprofits, well, I have a science background and I love doing experiments that create learnings and then putting those lessons learned and best practices together and sharing them. And that's something I found that the for-profit businesses similar to us in our industry are not as forthcoming in sharing what they know. But we totally are. Why? Because we have a mission to proliferate reuse everywhere. So for example, you know, cities from all around the country call us and say, we need help, teach us how you did what you do. I'm so happy to do that because it's part of our mission to create the solutions, figure out how it works at a low risk, package that into something that other cities can proliferate. So it's kind of like, it's about funding, it's also about our mission. And I just love that we run, um, you know, we run like a startup, but we have all this really risk-taking ability because we're a nonprofit. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think that it gives a lot of good perspective. I think there are times when people may know that nonprofits have a lot more resources afforded to them. You know, nonprofits can get certain services at discount mm -hmm. or for free in a lot of cases. Um, and But I think there are some things that kind of trip people up if maybe they're considering the same. Um, one of those being like, how do you create a board of directors oh, or an executive board? It's so hard. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I will say, yeah. uh, it is not easy to run a nonprofit. There are a lot of complexities. Some of, if you're doing well, some of it just takes luck and most of it's really hard work. So just starting a nonprofit, people, people tell me, oh, I want to start a nonprofit. And I usually say, I don't think you do. <laughs> it's really hard. There's like these 82 page documents that you have to fill out and they're so complicated. They just made me cry. So I had the Duke Law Clinic help me do it. Um, and then you have to choose a board of directors. And if as a founder, you have to do that. And I've learned so much in these all these years of running this nonprofit of how to determine what your nonprofit needs and then finding people who can fill that need. And it's really an art choosing a board of directors. And hopefully, like, I think the best way is to get one really solid person and then have them help you build that board. Um, it is very much not easy. The executive director, their boss is the board. So you really wanna have a good one um, that believes in the mission and can help you craft the strategy for meeting that mission. It definitely is a whole other beast than a for-profit. And something that we're discovering that many folks may not know, if they truly have a mission-driven idea and really do want to start a nonprofit to take advantage of some of the things I've mentioned, you can have a for-profit subsidiary of a nonprofit. That's one thing we're considering right now because the reuse world is kind of exploding and we're, we've sort of captured a market in a way with what we do because we sort of built this whole new industry that people are discovering is really important. You know, we have the ability to um, serve 
schools and school districts and corporate cafes and event venues and sports stadiums and just helping people go reusable and potentially, you know, the contracts that we're um, working on could be, could make our um, annual operating budget, you know, quadruple in a few months. And so we're like, you know, this is something that's potentially investable. You know, there could be investors who say, yeah, there's nothing else like this. Very few in the country, none in the Southeast region. And if you're interested as a nonprofit in equity investment, and maybe you've just got investors sniffing around and they're like, oh, I can't invest in a nonprofit, not to worry. You can create an, a for-profit subsidiary of a nonprofit that can accept equity investment. So as long as it is 100% related to your mission, which ours is inarguably. So, um, you know, there's so many options. Yeah, yeah, thank you for breaking that down. Um, and letting people know that that's an option. That's not something that I explicitly knew. I felt yeah, that it was. Me neither. But... Just, just learned it. <laughs> this episode was made possible with Savvy Cow. Scheduling meetings manually can be so time consuming. And scheduling video podcast interviews is no different. From making sure all your guests have the correct meeting link to following up with next steps, the list of emails goes on. But what if you could streamline this process with Savvy Cow? you can. Take the stress out of your scheduling workflows with customizable reminders, the ability to sync multiple calendars, and more at the link in the description. All right, let's get back to today's guest. Yeah. Um, so as we talk about investing, one of the main ways that people think about investing when it comes to nonprofit is fundraising and donations, yes. right? So in-kind donations, charitable donations, um, people giving in their will, just saying like, mm -hmm. when I die, I want all my money and assets to go to this nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the other ways? Because Don't Waste Durham has been around longer than Green to Go, right? So that started uh, about 10 years ago. Yep. So probably closer to 11 now, for being honest. So, you know, how are some of the ways that you initially, when you were just like getting off the ground and even thinking about, hey, I want to invest a part of our operating budget to try this reusable mm -hmm. product? Um, or piloting this reusable product? What are some of the ways that you were able to fundraise and get off the ground in those initial years? I'm so glad you asked. Um, so we were extremely scrappy and we do very, a huge amount with very little. Um, so uh, one fun story I like to tell is that, you know, when I first had this idea for Green to Go, it was actually way back in 2010. It wasn't called Green to Go at the time, I just thought to myself, I think we could try a reusable takeout container program. And so I submitted my idea to a magazine contest and it was called Extraordinary Solutions to Everyday Problems. And I just submitted the idea and I won runner up, which was very exciting. because I thought, see, somebody thinks my idea is cool. And it just like got me thinking and I started just standing on street corners with my little card table, like waving reusable containers around um, and telling telling everyone I could think of. But I started gathering another group of like, I just say we are all kind of weirdos and I just gathered this group of weirdos and we just started meeting every week thinking, how can we make this happen? And so we were all volunteers. That's a great thing if you really wanna start something that's completely bananas. You can do it with a bunch of other people who care. So we started a Kickstarter campaign, which is a, of course a crowdsource, crowdsource funding mechanism, crowdfunding. And I will not necessarily recommend it because it's very stressful. Um, you really have to put in 40 hours a week minimum to promote it. And if you don't raise the whole amount, you get nothing. So it's really a lot of pressure. Luckily, we made it um, and we raised $25,000, which sounds like a lot, but man, that goes fast when you're buying the initial set of containers and you're getting the equipment you need to wash and dry and you're doing some marketing to help get people to uh, sign up for this, restaurants and customers. And so that was like just the added little 
insertion of money that we needed to our basic like passionate weirdo club to get this off the ground. And lastly, you know, we needed in, we needed some infrastructure. We needed these return stations all over town. And you know, those are like could be expensive. We could order these large receptacles, but we decided to build them ourselves. So we just put out the word and said, "Hey everybody, we need your scrap wood. We need your lumber." We need your, whatever it is, um, pallets. And people would say, I have a bunch of wood in my garage. And I would literally drive around with my car and pick up wood from strangers' garages. And we'd put it in this pile. And we had community build sessions. And we had a design that a volunteer made for us. And we made these adorable return stations with all donated materials. So I... I encourage people out there, if they have a great idea and they feel that entrepreneurial spirit, like you don't necessarily need to have a giant amount of money to test an idea because that idea needs, you've got an idea, please test it tomorrow. If you need to build your prototype with toothpicks today so that you can go show someone, it's better than just pitching an idea on a stage. I think that's very important. And you can convince people of your passion and stuff like that. But what's even more valuable is if you can say, we had this idea, we designed it, and we tested it. And then we learned some stuff, and then we redesigned. And you can say with conviction, and they can see your results. And you can feel your results. And you can feel empowered to do something you don't need to wait for money. It's kind of like, do it now, and the money will come later. Um, don't wait. The world can't wait. The planet can't wait, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is something that I asked you off screen before we got started. And it's something that you thankfully ended on with saying like the planet can't wait. And that is a lot of um, some of the messaging that you hear when people are B Corps certified um, businesses, right? And you're a nonprofit, so you're not B Corps certified. But um, a lot of your ethos is centered around people, profit, and planet, right? And not necessarily your profit, but the profit of businesses. So how um, really adhering to environmental sustainability kind of metrics via reusing materials instead of using one-use plastics or, or cardboard or things like that can really help um, increase the profit margins of a business. I love, so, I love this question. Okay. <laughs> So when we think about, um, you know, small business owners who may want to also partake in this and being maybe, yeah, reusing materials in their community, but also um, just in their daily lives as business owners, how can I reduce my waste no matter what that is? What are some of the things that you talk about as you, you know, maybe are counseling, you know, other cities or counseling other municipalities or counseling other um, organizations, whether for-profit or non-profit, who want to learn from the model that you have built within the Durham community? Like, what are some of the ways that people can engage in sustainable practices um, that you recommend? I love this question. So I think of, you know, if we think of just environmental concerns first, you know, it's very overwhelming. You open the newspaper and you see that oh, the planet is dying and global climate change and we're all going to die. And you can feel very disempowered. You can feel depressed. And there's no clear picture like, okay, well, what can we do? You know, I guess we're all going to die. Um, and so I think green to go gives people something concrete that they can do. Like we just say, hey, you know, stop crying, get off the couch. Uh, you can sign up for Green To Go. It's just so low cost and affordable, and it allows you to make a different, make a behavior change. We make a behavior change easy, so that people can feel a little bit less depressed. And every time you return a container in our return station, it will show you how much you've contributed to saving waste and how much the whole community as collectively 
has uh, reduced the waste and saved carbon emissions. So if that's something that motivates you inwardly um, and you know you want to take an action because you just don't know what to do when you read that kind of news, that's one thing you can do. The other thing is restaurants are really struggling. Their profit margins are very, very slim. And even the most beautiful restaurants that you think are doing well, they're within months of closing down all the time because it's just very scary. And so if you think about two things restaurants want, they want to save money and they want to make money. And I, I really believe the reuse economy is one of the ways they can do that because yes, they are buying fewer disposable containers, but they're also getting more foot traffic to their businesses because this is something customers um, want more and more. You know, now waste and microplastics and all that kind of stuff is in mainstream media. So 10 years ago, people didn't really care about that. And now it's clear that people are starting to really care and really understand. And like you said, during the pandemic, they saw their kitchen trash cans piling up and it became more visceral and real to them. So, you know, in terms of a restaurant standing out and getting more customers, this is a great way to do that. The other thing is, um, you know, restaurants, they'll tell you if you ask them, they have to, um, you know, they're, they're subject to inflation all the time. They'll tell you, oh yeah, I used to be paying 25 cents um, a plate for my disposable plates or, or takeout containers, but you know, now they're 50 cents or 75 cents and they have no control over that. And they just have to eat that out of their profits and it's hurting them. And I talk to restaurants all the time. And so, and that's what inflation and global supply chain issues do to small businesses. Well, once you go reusable, you buy something durable one time and that circulates hyper-locally in a community. It makes you resilient, makes the community resilient because we're keeping resources in our community. We don't have to depend on what's happening in China when we buy a shipment on a, you know, on a cargo ship. No, we've already bought things once and you can use them a thousand times. And that's a thousand times fewer times you have to buy a disposable. So that makes a lot of sense too. And the last thing is that reuse equals labor, right? We know that if you just have a styrofoam plate and you throw it in the trash, that doesn't really create a lot of love. I mean, I don't feel love when I do that. And I also know that, um, you know, it's just going into the trash and that's getting hauled away. But reuse, on the other hand, requires pickup, wash, and delivery. Reuse creates jobs. And hyper-circulating um, our own resources right here in Durham, for example, makes us resilient to um, inflation, makes us no longer dependent on what's happening globally, and it creates jobs. And that is how, I mean, we're playing the long game here because we believe this is, yes, we're going to keep styrofoam out of the streams, but what we believe is more important right now is getting people out of poverty. If we can create wealth by these big contracts with, um, you know, places that would otherwise use a ton of disposables, now we have to hire drivers and dishwashers and managers and directors and it's an industry that I think can employ a lot of people. And so they're just a, a broad spectrum of economical impacts of the reuse economy. I love talking about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great because I have another question about that. Um, and I think it'll be a great question to end on because it is kind of the larger question that people love to say whenever you say, well, you know, why aren't you being more sustainable? Why aren't you caring about environmental impact? You know, why aren't you doing that? You know, whether that's from a single um, individual to a small business. And one thing people love to point out is, well, it's not really me that's creating a lot of the, 
the waste. It's these big corporations that are doing a lot of the environmental pollution. So my little action isn't isn't going to matter, right? It's not going to make that big of a difference, right? I have my personal opinions on that statement, but I would love to hear yours. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you're uh, extremely insightful, Angela, and a great thinker. Um, yes, so you and I are the kind of people who know that each of our individual behaviors does count for something. But I mean, mainstream America, let's face it, they do see their individual actions as a drop in the bucket, and they just kind of give up on that. Yeah, people like you and me might switch to a bamboo toothbrush and bring our own reusable bag, but let's face it, the majority of people are not going to do that probably ever. And so what I believe, um, you know, there are lots of groups out there that focus on helping people make individual behavior changes, and I think that's nice. But what I want to work on is systemic change that affects corporations, just like you are talking about. And I see the path to that. One is when we especially work on very large, what I call closed loop systems. So a school, for example, is a closed loop system. The kids come in, they eat their lunches, and they go home. They're not going to take their stainless steel lunch trays home with them. That's a closed loop, meaning we can come deliver stainless steel lunch trays and stainless steel sporks, they're going to eat off it, return them to a pile over here. We pick them up. There's not a lot of loss. It's a closed loop. And that does two things. One, it makes a massive amount of impact. So we're working with a school in East Durham right now. We switched them entirely off of disposable lunch serveware. The, lunch, the cafeteria staff love it. The kids love it. The teachers love it. Um, what it does is, now that that's a school that's, you know, 90% free and reduced lunch. So these are kids who might not otherwise be exposed to a reuse culture, but now they are because, because why? We've made it a norm in their school. So that's one. That's going to help with the development of their, you know, their, their feelings about what can be possible in the world. That's great. We want to do the right thing by our kids. We don't want to teach them to help the planet and then start give them disposables. You know, that's going to mess up their development of their personal integrity. There's a teacher who said, I believe doing that causes moral harm to children. So helping a large group of people um, shift to a cultural norm of reuse, that's what's going to make large impact on the large scale. Now you can do that in corporate, huge corporate campuses. You can do that at universities. You can do that at ball stadiums. And what you're doing is making it a norm. So it's no longer just one individual behavior. It's a system making a behavior. You do that enough and you'll start to affect industry. Because what does it mean? All of those businesses, all of those institutions are no longer buying disposable. That's going to hurt those corporations. And they're going to realize, we better switch our product line. We better start creating the best reusable items you've ever seen. So if we want to really make an impact and affect industry, I think we got to go big, make reuse a cultural norm by getting into these businesses and institutions where there's a large number of people. There's mainstream people who might not otherwise bring their own container. No worries. We provide it to you. It's the norm. We create the supply. And um, so, yes, you and I are the kind of people, individual change is great, but we don't have to worry about that because systemic change is where it's at and we're working on that every day. Yes, that is beautiful. I love that. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited for those students. I'm excited for this getting outside of the Durham community even more so than it is already. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for sharing. I know I got something out of it. I hope people listening and watching got something out of oh, it. Oh, thanks for having me, Angela. You're awesome. Yes. <laughs> so are you. So are you.